Up until now, we've mostly talked about countries. Some of them might have intrigued you, while others could have left you a bit cold. So what, in your opinion, could be the most livable capital city in the world? What are the essential characteristics that a country's capital should definitely have? In previous videos, we went on a journey in various regions of Russia. Now let's talk about Moscow. The capital city of this vast country with the largest surface area and take a look at Russia from a whole perspective. We're well aware that Russia is mind-bogglingly massive, covering around 17 million square kilometers. Moscow, which is considered the heart of this colossal nation, is situated slightly to the east of Belarus and a bit north of Ukraine. So it's not placed in the northern regions where Siberia's freezing cold dominates, but rather in a more temperate and warm part of the country, along the western border. Contrary to the bone-chilling minus 50 degrees Celsius temperatures you might find in the north of Russia, Moscow experiences milder winter weather, with temperatures hovering around minus 20 degrees Celsius. However, a biting coldness prevails during this season. If we zoom in a bit on the city on the map, we can see that it doesn't cover an exceptionally large area. In fact, the total land area of Moscow is only 2511 square kilometers. Moscow, undoubtedly Russia's most popular city, is home to approximately 19 million people. The closest city to it, St. Petersburg, houses 6 million residents. It's quite remarkable that Moscow has been the capital of Russia and the Russian people for over 850 years. Of course, the way to fit this dense population into a small area is through the construction of high-rise skyscraper buildings. In this crucial city of Russia, you can see hundreds of tall buildings. The rental prices for an average apartment here, which are somewhat better than the normal standards, start at 80,000 rubles. The dollar equivalent of these three-bedroom apartments, which would cost you a minimum of 80,000 rubles, is at least $800, my friends. So if you're thinking of living in Russia and Moscow in particular, where the city hosts billionaires from around the world, the cost of living in this city hovers around a minimum of $2,000 per month. You can find apartments for 50,000 rubles. However, these apartments are at least 20 years old and are located far from the city center or are very small. Almost half of the world's capital cities have a coastline, but Moscow is not situated near any sea. Flowing through the heart of the city is a river known as the Moscow River, and this river serves as a peaceful recreation area for the Russian people, both in winter and summer. This river, which cuts through the heart of the city, has been bridged with small bridges to provide land connections serving the people. As you can tell from the presence of rivers, the city is built on a vast plain. As for the famous Moscow Kremlin Palace, it is located in the very heart and center of the city. This palace is one of Russia's biggest symbols, and almost everyone who visits Russia has a photo taken in front of the Moscow Kremlin Palace. Today, it is also Putin's official residence. Since it's the city of high courts, the center of the country's administration, and the playground of wealthy oligarchs, you can often see luxury official vehicles with sirens blaring, causing traffic jams in the city. Let's also mention that in Russia, there are many palaces with the name Kremlin. On the other hand, the famous Red Square, as it's commonly known in English, is of course located in the capital, and the square's surroundings are paved with cobblestone roads, and there's not a speck of litter in sight. Red Square is the most popular area where tourists visiting Russia and Moscow spend their time. The architecture in this city's lifeline is built on such a foundation. The square here is so vast that when presidents like Putin make speeches or on national celebration days, Red Square is filled to the brim with millions of people. 
Another symbol of Moscow, the historic St. Basil's Cathedral, stands proudly in this red square and is one of its greatest icons. Currently, there's not a heavy influx of tourists from abroad to the square. The reason for this is Russia's chilly diplomatic relations with the West and Western airlines have reduced or halted their flights to Russia. However, Russia's large domestic population and abundant resources keep them from being too dependent on the outside world. Therefore, their capital is never an empty and quiet place at any time of the year. The biggest indicator of this is the never-ending festivals held in Moscow. If you're lucky, you might stumble upon these eye-catching festivals when you visit. These festivals may be ordinary for the locales, but I'm sure they'll be quite intriguing for those coming to Moscow from the outside. Today, much of the world is still experiencing the summer months. And in Moscow, people are still strolling around in short sleeves. If I were to show you a bit of the bustling life there, I can say that the city is extremely lively both during the day and in the evening. Despite the impacts of history, Moscow offers an active and comfortable way of life. People fill the streets of Moscow with their groups of friends and almost no one walks alone. Some sit on benches with their friends, some excitedly share stories in cafes and others have their photos taken by photographers in the streets. The photography part is important because when you go to Moscow, you might come across something you don't see very often. In the city center, you'll find photographers wandering around with professional cameras, capturing the beauty-conscious Russian people for a fee. This way, the people being photographed have immortal memories and someone else earns a living. In fact, some photographers have raised the bar so high that they choose a busy spot in the city, set up a backdrop and provide a more professional background for those who want to have their photos taken. There's really no need for that because every corner of Moscow, its parks, rivers, streets and architecture provide ample opportunities for taking perfect photographs and being photographed, especially the city's architecture, reminiscent of Western European styles, doesn't fall short and each of these architectural wonders holds iconic status for the country. Whatever you expect from a capital or an ideal city to live in, Moscow largely meets these requirements. If you want to go to a restaurant, you have hundreds of options in front of you. If you're tired of going to the same park or nightclub, there are hundreds more to explore. Or do you enjoy meeting new people continuously? Moscow has more new faces and new people than you can imagine. The best part is that the country, Russia, offers you the highest income earning opportunities available. If you want to live in such a vibrant city with magnificent architecture today, You'll need a net income in the range of $4,000 to $5,000 per month in Moscow. Otherwise, Moscow's luxurious lifestyle could strain your budget. If Moscow is too expensive for you, but you still want to be in close proximity, the city of Vladimir just east of Moscow might be an option. Further east, there's Kazan, a large city with a vibrant atmosphere. Kazan is actually the capital of Tatarstan, an autonomous republic in Russia. Or perhaps you're looking for a less populated but developed city near the Finnish border. That would be St. Petersburg, located north of Moscow. Moscow doesn't just attract adults. Young people from all over Russia flock to the city as well. This is because the country's biggest technical universities are located in Moscow and young individuals come here to receive an education that can lead to international career opportunities. Today, Moscow boasts 13 universities making it a city that appeals to people of all ages, not just adults. On the other hand, you can see a lot of people taking photos and being photographed in Moscow because Russians, especially Russian women, really love having their photos taken. Even if you take their pictures without them noticing, when they realize it, they don't react aggressively or angrily. Instead, they smile and pose for the camera. Indeed, Russians often have their phones in hand constantly taking photos of themselves, even if you're not photographing them. It seems that Russians don't just seek approval from the outside world, but from themselves as well. When you look at people's faces, you can clearly see the characteristics of the Slavic race. About eight out of 10 people have fair skin and they are often blonde. Consequently, many Russians have blue or green eyes. Beauty, of course, is subjective, but there's no denying the global fascination with the Slavic look. Russians seem to be aware of this attention, which probably contributes to their high self-confidence. 
Moreover, Russians dress quite elegantly, not just when they're going out at night, but even during casual daytime meetings with friends. Russia is a country belonging to the Orthodox branch of Christianity, but the country's religious structure and governance style don't intervene in the clothing and lifestyles of its people. People can freely dress and live as they wish, and there's no societal or governmental pressure on them. They enjoy their freedom. Here, people dance not only in venues, but also in the streets during the daytime. Their zest for life is by no means lagging behind Western European lifestyles. They are full of energy and exhibit fun-loving behaviors. The high motivation of Moscow's residents also provides a livelihood for young people who want to make money by playing music. Musicians playing various instruments can be found on every corner of the streets. So while strolling through Moscow, you might constantly hear beautiful melodies. Furthermore, in the evening during sunset hours, Moscow's sidewalks start to fill up with people and you can hardly find an empty pavement. Even if people don't go to cafes, they fill up these parks and sidewalk areas with their loved ones. In fact, in Moscow, some people park their cars in a corner and open their car trunks to enjoy hookah. This is not an uncommon sight, and those who can't find space in parks take their hookahs and drinks and enjoy the open air in the trunks of their cars. Some prefer to spend time chatting by the green banks of the Moscow River instead of eating and drinking. Or, some Russians may use benches for different purposes in the evenings. One notable detail on Moscow streets is that, despite being quite young, people consume a lot of tobacco products. You also won't see a large elderly population of over 65 in the city. Almost all the people you encounter on the streets are under 50. Elderly people are usually seen in the metro and don't draw much attention on the streets. Speaking of the metro, it's worth noting that Moscow has one of the world's largest and most extensive metro networks. This city boasts a transportation network detailed enough to match the splendor of a capital, and what's more, Moscow's metro stations, like other Russian metros, have quite impressive architecture. These ultra-stylish metro designs inherited from the Soviets are truly one of Russia's best features. To show you this better, you can observe for yourself just how elegant and clean each metro station in Moscow is. Across the country, Russia's metro system hosts more than 160 stations on 11 lines. Another noteworthy aspect in Moscow is the abundance of luxury cars. You'll especially see these luxury cars coming out in the evening hours and each one is absolutely dazzling. No matter where you turn, Ferraris, Lamborghinis, Mercedes and more varieties of cars suddenly appear before your eyes. There's a street in the city called Malaya Bronia, and it's where Moscow's elite reside, where taxes are abundant and where the wealthy frequently spend their time. So, in Moscow streets like Malaya and Petrovka, you can see the most expensive branded shopping centers and the most luxurious vehicles. In the evenings, you can immerse yourself in the traffic and crowds of these streets. Furthermore, due to Moscow's cosmopolitan and multinational composition, even if you don't speak Russian fluently, you can overcome communication issues with your English. The city's multinational makeup also means it offers dishes that match your palate when it comes to its food culture. Additionally, Moscow's bustling streets are among the most frequented areas for newlyweds. People often choose Moscow's elite neighborhoods for their wedding celebrations. And if you see several bride and groom pairs and hundreds of guests gathered around the Moscow River, don't be surprised. The wedding ceremonies of these Moscow residents are not characterized by extravagant music and grandeur. Instead, they are more simple, with intimate gatherings of close family and friends. In summary today, despite Russia's political challenges, Moscow has a vibrant and secure atmosphere. It seems that this city will continue to be one of the world's most coveted and intriguing capitals. At least the people of Moscow appear content with living in their country, and there are no signs of fear or restriction in their faces. If your country isn't extremely small, 
Chances are there's another popular city aside from the capital. Just like in Italy, where Naples stands out as well as Rome, in England there is Manchester as well as London. Spain boasts Madrid and Barcelona, and in Russia, St. Petersburg takes the spotlight aside from Moscow. St. Petersburg is situated in the northwest of Russia, covering an area of 1439 square kilometers and hosting a population of 6 million. It's considered the fourth most populous city in Europe. While Russia's capital, Moscow, ranks second with a population of 12 million, the most populous city in Europe is Istanbul, with over 18 million inhabitants. St. Petersburg is sometimes even more favored than Moscow in Russia. This is because of its geographical location. It's the closest mega Russian city to Europe. Not only is it right below Finland, but it's also just a two hour drive from Baltic countries like Estonia. So a resident of St. Petersburg with the right documents can find themselves in European countries within one, two hours, enjoying an active life between Russia and Europe. Another advantage of the city over Moscow is its excellent access to the sea. Remember, Moscow only has rivers passing through it. But if you look at a map of St. Petersburg, you'll see that the western edge of the city opens up to the Gulf of Finland. Beyond the Gulf of Finland lies the Baltic Sea, of course. The presence of the sea is one of the most powerful factors that can make a city popular. This is because the number of activities to do increases with access to the sea. For instance, Russians can head to the beaches of St. Petersburg for a swim, but such an opportunity doesn't exist in Moscow. People in St. Petersburg can take leisurely walks with their families on the city's beaches, especially after the evening rush hour. Residents can enjoy the sea air and relieve stress on the city's shores. If only the summers in St. Petersburg were longer, it could have been one of Russia's and the world's biggest vacation cities. Unfortunately, the summers here come and go quickly, meaning the weather cools down rapidly. Furthermore, not only does the sea flow through the city, but a river does as well. This river is called the Neva River, and it comes from Lake Ladoga to the east of St. Petersburg, splitting the city into three branches before flowing into the Gulf of Finland. This creates a situation where the western part of St. Petersburg is actually comprised of Ililands. Each of these islands has its own unique name. One of them is called New Holland. Like in New York, these islands are connected by bridges, making the city a cohesive whole. In total, there are 42 islands and islets in the city. In addition to the islets, St. Petersburg is known as Russia's Venice with its 55 canals and nearly 500 bridges. Alongside these canals, you'll find many grand houses in a yachting style. These houses often serve as residences for the country's wealthy elite or are turned into investment hotels. Some of these buildings have been left vacant by their owners as they are considered outdated compared to the modern era. The price tags for these buildings, especially the ones in need of renovation, can be truly staggering, reaching around $50 million for some of them. Another captivating aspect of the city is its experience of white nights. No, I'm not talking about the lively nightlife you might find in places like Thailand where the night never seems to end. The white nights here are a natural phenomenon that occurs in areas near the polar circles. I mean nights where the sun never quite sets. During the summer months, daylight in this city can last for over 19 hours. The sun rises around 3 in the morning and sets around 11 at night. Take a look at these scenes. They belong to the middle of the night, yet the sky is not dark. St. Petersburg is the city closest to the Arctic Circle, making this phenomenon more pronounced here compared to places like Sweden or Norway. Russians celebrate this period, which starts in May and lasts until July with numerous events and festivals, turning the city into an entertainment hub. Music, dance, light shows, and various visual spectacles transform the city into one of the world's premier destinations. So, it's safe to say that this city doesn't sleep during the summer. However, if you're someone who can't sleep in the light and dislikes noise, especially during the summer months, staying in St. Petersburg might prove to be a bit challenging. Russians have marketed this phenomenon so beautifully to the world that before the war, millions of people from around the globe would visit St. Petersburg every year just to witness the White Knights firsthand and see the stars in the brightness of the night. 
In fact, we're only just beginning to realize how special St. Petersburg truly is. This place had immense potential even during the time of Imperial Russia. It served as the capital of Imperial Russia for a full 200 years. It was founded by Russian Tsar Peter in the early 1700s. Originally, the city was nothing more than a swamp. The name Peter in the city's name comes from Tsar Peter's name, and Berg is derived from the German word for castle. Peter, having traveled throughout Europe, was deeply inspired and particularly enamored with Venice. He envisioned St. Petersburg as Russia's version of Venice and set about creating a city of canals. He saw St. Petersburg as Russia's gateway to Europe and invested heavily in the city for this purpose. For instance, the city's first university was established in 1724 and since then. Over 40 universities have opened their doors for education and research in St. Petersburg. Even today, the city continues to attract students from all over Russia and is home to some of Russia's top engineering and technical universities, alongside Moscow. The most famous and long-standing university in the city is St. Petersburg State University. If you have an interest in the history of World War II, some of you may have heard of a city named Leningrad and the sieges it endured during that period. Leningrad, which suffered immense tragedies during World War II, resisted sieges for 900 days without giving in. Well, that very Leningrad is none other than St. Petersburg, my friends. In 1924, it was renamed Leningrad in honor of Lenin shortly after his death. The city retained the name Leningrad during the Soviet Union era and was only renamed back to St. Petersburg in 1991 after the dissolution of the Soviet Union during Boris Yeltsin's government. That's why this city is not just an ordinary one for Russia and is well known throughout the world. The city has been so well preserved throughout history that it encapsulates many aspects of Russia, both from the imperial era and the Soviet period. The most significant evidence of this heritage is the magnificent buildings that adorn the city with its unique architecture. I bet when you visit St. Petersburg, you'll never want to put down your phone or camera. With every step you take, you'll encounter architectural marvels more beautiful than the last, and you'll either take their pictures or pose in front of them. The incredible architecture in the city is often in shades of white and brown, adorning the main streets from end to end. St. Petersburg is not just competitive with Moscow. It surpasses many capitals in European countries. Nevsky Prospect, which is the heart of the city, is like the lifeline of St. Petersburg. In the historical and architecturally adorned Nevsky Avenue, you won't spot a single piece of litter on the streets. This area is the most prominent and consistently well-maintained part of St. Petersburg. The architecture you're witnessing steeped in history often harks back to Russia's imperial era. Each building has its own story and significance. Hence, the city is visually stunning and can easily rival Moscow in terms of aesthetics. The streets are bustling with people, especially during working hours, and you'll see plenty of people and cars moving from one place to another. However, what truly elevates your visual experience in St. Petersburg isn't just the clean streets and architecture. It's as if the most beautiful people in Russia gathered here, alongside Moscow. Russian people are either spending time with their friends in cafes or taking plenty of photos of themselves. The streets and parks are always lively, and you'll encounter a city that's very much alive. Similar scenes can be found in Moscow, and the Russians here exude a level of confidence in their beauty. Almost no one is alone, and Russians genuinely enjoy making friends and being social. They are hardly stay at home. During the day they go to work and at night, they immerse themselves in the flow of St. Petersburg. They always have plans and a schedule. They dress up and enjoy themselves until the wee hours of the night. The streets are filled with more luxury cars at night and the wealthy Russians dominate the nightlife scene with their flashy toys. Additionally, Russians are glued to their phones day and night. If they're not chatting with friends, they spend minutes on end staring at their screens, engrossed in their phones. If you observe how crowded the parks in St. Petersburg are in the evening and on weekends, you can see that these people truly embrace life. Since the city doesn't have a problem with park and green space availability, you can easily spend time with your loved ones in any of the numerous parks. Furthermore, 
the sounds of music and the presence of artists in these areas contribute to creating a beautiful atmosphere in St. Petersburg. In fact, this city is renowned as an art city. There are hundreds of museums and historical sites here. The Hermitage Museum, the Kazan Cathedral and the Peterhof Palace are just a few of them. Especially when it comes to Russian architecture, the Kazan Cathedral is one of the most magnificent structures that comes to mind. Designed in the shape of a crescent, it has stood in all its grandeur since 1801. St. Petersburg has a highly educated population with over 90% literacy among women. Russian women in this city are well-educated and are known for their courage and skills when it comes to career choices. They don't let gender stereotypes dictate their career paths. Considering that St. Petersburg is one of the two most livable cities in Russia, you can imagine the demand from this country's 145 million people to live here. Consequently, rental prices in this city have increased almost as much as in Moscow. If you check rental prices for apartments on Russian real estate websites, finding a place for less than around 75,000 rubles per month is nearly impossible. The average prices for these apartments can easily go up to 150,000 rubles. To give you an idea, 100,000 rubles is roughly equivalent to $1,000. So if you plan to rent a two-bedroom apartment in St. Petersburg, be prepared to spend around $1,000 if you find these rental prices too high and are willing to live just outside the city, small towns like Kudrovo have been built nearby. These areas are home to people who work in St. Petersburg, but choose to live in less expensive high-rise buildings in quieter areas. While some residents of St. Petersburg do earn good salaries to afford these high rents, a significant portion of the city's millions of inhabitants may not even earn $1,000 a month. Therefore, multiple family members often work together to cover rent and other expenses. People may appear well-groomed, but they don't necessarily enjoy a luxurious standard of living. To maintain a comfortable lifestyle in this city, an average family typically needs to earn at least $3,000 a month. Transportation in the city is generally done by subways and buses. There are bus routes that provide access to many different areas from Nevsky Avenue, which is considered the heart of the city. Moreover, St. Petersburg's metro system not only serves as a means of transportation, but also acts as a tourist attraction in its own right. The success of the Russians in metro architecture is truly commendable. Similar to the metros in many cities around the world, they have constructed the St. Petersburg metro in a stunningly beautiful manner. This city's metro not only moves people from one place to another, but also offers a visual masterpiece. There are 54 metro stations in the city, and you can reach even the farthest points of St. Petersburg by metro. If you travel from Moscow to St. Petersburg by train, it takes approximately five hours. Additionally, if you arrive in this city on a cruise, you can stay here visa-free for 72 hours. Despite being close to the European region, Russian is predominantly spoken here. Although the rate of foreign language proficiency is higher compared to other regions in Russia, if you don't speak Russian well, it may take you quite some time to adapt and make connections in St. Petersburg. If you are unfamiliar with the Cyrillic alphabet, you need to not only understand the spoken language but also figure out the writing. Signs, including those on official institutions, are in Russian and written in Cyrillic script throughout the city. If there's one thing that could potentially dampen your spirits in St. Petersburg, it's the city's frequent rainfall. If you ever plan to live in this city, you should be prepared for rain and overcast skies. In summary, St. Petersburg is undoubtedly one of Russia's most vibrant cities. The majority of these people reside in well-known cities such as the capital Moscow and St. Petersburg. Russia is often associated with these prominent urban centers. However, beyond these cities, Russia comprises republics and cities that are less heard of and sometimes forgotten. Here's one of them, the Republic of Karia. It is undoubtedly one of Russia's most unique regions, situated just east of Finland. Within the territory of Russia, Karelia is an autonomous republic. 
It has a population of approximately 700,000 people and covers an area of 180,000 square kilometers. Located in the northwest of Russia, about 85% of the region is densely covered by forests. As a result, the livelihoods of the people here are closely tied to the timber industry, which revolves around harvesting and processing the rich timber resources from these forests. Kalia's capital, Petrozavodska, gives the impression of a modern European city when viewed from above. The region is so close to Finland that the local population often visits Finland. This proximity has also influenced the architecture in Karelia, making it somewhat similar to Finnish architecture. You can see colorful wooden buildings that are visually appealing and resemble the architectural style found in Finland. These wooden structures were constructed by people of Finnish origin. However, Russians, in contrast to the Karelian locals, do not have a strong affinity for this tradition of colorful wooden houses. They tend to view these buildings more as rotting wood piles. Indeed, in Russia's major cities, you won't find much of a tradition of wooden houses. People here lead a peaceful life, far removed from the hustle and bustle of Russia's major cities. The roads are in good condition, and there are trees at every corner. In fact, during the summer, many people from Russia's central regions come here to spend their vacations. Looking at the map, you can see that the eastern part of Karelia has a coastline, where areas suitable for swimming have been developed. Karia also boasts a special place called Kizhi Island, which is one of the most serene and stress-free locations in Russia. Unfortunately, such special places are relatively unknown to people outside of Russia, and they haven't been promoted to the world's travelers as effectively as they could be. For example, on Kizhi Island, which is part of Karelia, Russian architecture is more prevalent. Due to its remote location, many structures from the Soviet era have managed to stand without significant damage. The island is only about 5.5 kilometers in length, making it impossible for a permanent settlement to be established. There are only two churches on the island, and they are both remarkable relics from years gone by. Returning to the general overview of Karelia, despite the often overcast weather, it's important to know that the region's forests are abundant with fruits. Karelia is an important trading point for fruit exports to Russia's central regions. The most common fruits there are blackberries, and the local population never pays for blackberries during their forest walks. If you want to buy blackberries when you visit Karelia, they sell one kilogram of blackberries for about $130. Now, let's journey from the westernmost part of Russia to the easternmost. This place is called Sakhalin, an island that is the largest in Russia. It boasts an impressive area of around 72,000 square kilometers, which is roughly equivalent to the land area of the Czech Republic. In contrast to the Finnish culture in Karelia, Sakhalin Island is a place where Japanese and Russian cultures blend. In fact, Russia and Japan still have disputes over islands like these. In the 19th and 20th centuries, both the Japanese and Russians wanted to claim this island as their own territory. At one point between 1905 and 1945, the island was even a part of the Japanese Empire. However, after World War II, when Japan was weakened, Russia took advantage of the situation and took the island from Japan, incorporating it into its own territory. Today, the southern part of Sakhalin Island faces another island that belongs to Japan. The distance between these two islands is only about 43 kilometers. While the region boasts stunning natural beauty, its remote location at one of the world's farthest points means it doesn't receive many visitors. Even getting to Sakhalin Island from within Russia is challenging, requiring hours of plane travel. Russia's currently weak diplomatic relations with the rest of the world have further hindered the discovery of islands like Sakhalin on a global scale. Nowadays, those wanting to reach Sakhalin Island from the Russian mainland must take a ferry as there isn't much demand for permanent settlement. This is partly due to the fact that this island group, including Sakhalin, is located in a region prone to some of the world's largest earthquakes. While the Japanese are more accustomed to such earthquakes, the Russians less so. Therefore, most people visit Sakhalin Island for sightseeing rather than permanent residence. The influence of the Soviet era is evident in this vast island as it is throughout Russia. There are numerous Soviet-era ruins on the island, which are now completely abandoned. The people living on the island lead a typical village-town life, 
making their living primarily through fishing along the island's coasts. There is an abundance of bird and fish species on the island, and you might even spot seals. If you want to get a bird's eye view of the island, you can take a cable car ride in Sakhalin. On the abandoned lighthouse on the island, birds have now made nests, taking it over from humans. Apart from this beautiful island, there is a neglected city in Russia that you can see on your way to St. Petersburg. This place called Kudrovo is a place where Russia's tallest concrete buildings are built, creating a lifeless environment. Those who work in St. Petersburg live in Kudrovo to avoid the high rents in the city. In other words, Kudrovo is one of the places in Russia where mass housing designed for low-income families is most prevalent. These buildings, constructed by government-supported contractors, are known for their poor construction materials and designs that lack architectural flair. The apartments inside are typically smaller than 80 square meters. As people walk through this city, they appear like ants amidst the towering skyscrapers. Not only people, but even cars seem quite small when you take a bird's eye view of the town. Each building in Kudrovo is around 20 stories high, which might not seem like a great option for those who fear heights. Each housing complex accommodates an average of 3,700 apartments, highlighting the extreme level of urbanization here. However, the people in this area might be luckier compared to other regions in Russia. At least they have newly built, clean homes and decent roads. But not everyone is as fortunate. For example, consider Krasnodar, a city with a population of around 700,000. It covers a tiny area of about 339 square kilometers, making it a densely populated city. It's not a forgotten corner of Russia. It's located in the North Caucasus. The city's main streets are reasonably livable and well-maintained. However, in some streets during winter, the roads turn into real swamps. Even the asphalt looks as old as the buildings, and the electrical cables give you the impression of an underdeveloped city. The bad part is that it's now raining, and the people of Krasnodar don't have asphalt roads like Kudrovo, so they're walking on muddy surfaces. The city's biggest issue is the soft ground, which turns into a quagmire during heavy rain. Some areas of the city give the impression that the roads were forgotten when the buildings were constructed. Russia is such an immense expanse that wherever you cast your eyes on the map, you encounter a wealth of detail and diverse landscapes. Take this place, for example, the city of Magadan, which hugs the Sea of Okhotsk. It's one of the furthest outposts in Russia, located in the Far East, and has a history dating back to the Stalin era. Mention Magadan to Russians and images of bone-chilling cold, gulag labor camps and rugged rural landscapes come to mind. The city is home to approximately 100,000 people, yet it boasts hundreds of ghostly buildings. It's almost perpetually blanketed in a pristine coat of white snow, with buildings donning various shades of white. The cold here is so intense that people store their food outside their windows, rendering refrigerators almost obsolete. This is one of Russia's less invested areas, and due to limited demand, new buildings aren't sprouting up in the city. Nevertheless, it's claimed that the bus stops and vistas here offer some of the world's best bus stop views. Recently abandoned buildings still contain the belongings of those who once called them home. The overall condition of inhabited buildings mirrors this description. Now, let's move to Tuva, or as foreigners sometimes call it, Taiva. It's one of Russia's autonomous republics, and interestingly, it has Turkish origins. Situated in the south of Russia, just north of Mongolia, Tuva is neighboring another Turkish autonomous republic, Altai, to the west. According to experts, Tuva Republic is the exact geographical center of Asia. Despite its strategic importance, it remains one of Russia's relatively unknown regions. Today, it boasts a population of nearly 350,000. And this Turkic Republic covers an extensive territory of over 170,000 square kilometers, surpassing the size of many countries. The capital city, known as the Red City in Tuvan, gets its name from the meaning red, and one-third of the Republic's population calls this city their home. One of the most striking indicators of Russia's lack of attention to this region is the frequent dust storms that plague the Republic. With streets and roads often left unpaved, even the slightest breeze can whip up blinding dust clouds. 
If you take a stroll in the capital, Kaisel, you'll notice that many of the roads are not even asphalted. Moreover, Tuva is one of the regions within Russia where air pollution is at its peak. The use of coal for heating in the area results in the skies being veiled in a greyish haze. Overall, Tuva exudes the aura of an underdeveloped town. Houses often resemble rustic wooden cottages, and the cars in use seem to have stepped right out of the pages of history, dating back 20 to 25 years. While new buildings do exist, they aren't necessarily in the best condition either. As an example, a children's park has been set up atop construction debris, forcing kids to play with dusty equipment. Even what we'd call new buildings have quite underwhelming entrances, resembling more of a warehouse entrance than that of an apartment building. It's worth noting that homeless individuals sometimes sleep in front of these apartment buildings. Additionally, there are I unfortunately discarded garbage bags left in the middle of the streets with no garbage containers in sight. In the local parks, you'll also find Soviet-era playground equipment. It seems that the Russian government may not be investing much in Tuva, nor allocating resources to the area. However, Tuva's woes extend beyond pollution. Unemployment is a significant issue. High unemployment rates have also contributed to an increase in crime. With a population of around 350,000, Tuva witnesses approximately 8,500 crimes each year. While the official unemployment rate in the Republic stands at 12%, locals assert that the actual rate of unemployment exceeds 25% of the population. Both unemployment and low wages are driving people towards illegal activities. Those fortunate enough to have a job typically earn an average monthly salary of around $400. Not every person in the Tuva Republic lives in cities. A quarter of the population continues the nomadic culture passed down from their ancestors, residing in the vast expanses of the steppe. There, they practice their own music, beliefs, and languages free from the influences of the modern world. However, even in their steppe dwellings, there is an alarming level of garbage pollution, and the environment doesn't appear very healthy. It seems that the trash accumulating in the cities is being disposed of in these steppe lands, and there doesn't appear to be a designated waste collection area. Those living in the steppe engage in small and large livestock farming, selling milk produced from these animals to the people of Tuva. Interestingly, they also raise pigs. The people of Tuva adhere to ancient shamanistic beliefs rather than Islam, so they have no aversion to raising pigs. These pigs serve as a source of both meat and milk for them. Russia, of course, is not limited to just this. It harbors numerous unexplored and unique regions. There are remote and mysterious places on Earth where few venture, where the climate and living conditions are extremely harsh. Some of these places, despite their historical significance, have fallen into disrepair and neglect. One such place you may have heard of is the city of Vorkuta. Today, it's one of the northernmost cities in Russia and among the most remote settlements in the world. The city is so far north and isolated that for more than half the year, it experiences shades of grey between the black and white in the sky. In fact, until relatively recently, Vorkuta was a strategic location within the Soviet Union and a significant mining center, particularly for coal. However, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, Vorkuta's decline began and coal mines started closing one after the other. As a result, over the past 30 years, two-thirds of the city's population migrated to different parts of Russia. Today, it's estimated that there are only around 10,000 active residents in this city, which covers an enormous area of 24,000 square kilometers. To put that into perspective, this city's area is larger than many countries and major cities around the world. This low population density has truly turned Vorkuta into a ghost town. Russia's current geopolitical situation, characterized by weak global relations, makes it even more challenging for such remote cities to be visited or for permanent settlements to be established there. It seems that the current Russian government is not investing adequately in these small settlements and is allowing them to be forgotten. Today, Vorkuta lacks basic amenities like hospitals, universities or major supermarkets. In fact, there isn't even a proper highway leading to the city. The only connection to the outside world is a train track, and even that was constructed by inmates of the Soviet-era gulag labor camps. 
Before these prisoners built the railway, they arrived in Vorkuta by navigating the rivers in boats. For those who want to reach the city from Moscow today, they have to endure a grueling train journey that takes a whopping 45 hours or approximately two days non-stop. It's quite an ordeal, my friends. While there is an airport in the city, the dismal and harsh weather conditions of Vorkuta make it challenging for the airport to provide regular services. Furthermore, there's hardly any demand for flights to this remote location. Before we delve into the present-day scenes of life in Vorkuta, it's essential to touch on its recent history. This city was, in fact, the very location of those infamous Gulag prisons during the Soviet Union era. Ordered by Vladimir Lenin and later intensified under Joseph Stalin's rule from the 1930s to the 1950s, Vorkuta was a labor camp. Politicans and city dwellers who opposed or criticized the Soviet regime were exiled here as a form of punishment. These individuals were not only isolated from society, but also subjected to forced labor in coal mines to serve the regime. The working conditions in these camps were so severe that those exiled to Vorkuta could not withstand the harsh cold, which could drop to 50 degrees Celsius and the grueling treatment. In the first 30 years after the gulags were established, according to some sources, approximately 1.7 million people, or according to others, more than 3 million people, perished in the midst of these harsh conditions. The gulags were closed by the state a few years after Stalin's death, around 1960. An attempt was made to create a new life there. In fact, after the 1960s, Vorkuta was on its way to becoming a modern Russian city with luxurious Soviet-style buildings and businessmen coming to the city. Those looking for work in Russia could easily find jobs in significant industrial cities like Vorkuta. These people also received social incentives such as rent assistance from the government. With 13 major active mines in Vorkuta, it became a place not only exporting coal to Russia but to the whole world. Coal mining met the significant fuel needs of the past 100 years. Bam. However, over time, Makuta, a city that had such a bad image among the Russian population, became a place where people no longer wanted to endure. In the eyes of Russians, it lost its value again and people became averse to staying here. The 13 active mining companies in the region began to close their mines one by one. The closure of the mines, which was the most important job market in the region, also harmed the small businesses that catered to the needs of the people working there. The main reason for the closure of the mines in Vorkuta is the advancement of world technology, which made the Vorkuta mines worthless. In other words, while coal was an amazing source of fuel for heating, Factories and machines 5,100 years ago, the discovery of natural gas and oil fields in places like Kortar and Kuwait in the modern technological age diminished the importance of coal. Countries shifted their focus to technologies powered by oil resources discovered in Arab countries rather than using old machines powered by coal. Therefore, Vorkuta couldn't escape its bad image from the Gulag era and couldn't become a modern, developed city. Today, there are still statues of Soviet leaders and buildings from their era in Vorkuta. When you look at the city from above, you won't see any signs of new construction or movement. There's no traffic or crowds to be seen. The city is like a horror movie set in pale colors, reminiscent of a place where ghosts would live. In reality, many buildings are still reasonably intact and look elegant. However, limited transportation options mean that even Russia's homeless population isn't attracted to the region. There are only four active coal mines in the area where coal is actively extracted, and the scattered people you see around are those working in these mining companies. They paint their living buildings to distinguish them from other abandoned ones. Just seeing the cars around the buildings hints at some signs of life, albeit small. The interiors of abandoned buildings look like carefully prepared film sets or the atmosphere of a video game. This place is so close to the North Pole that even in these months of the year, the snow there doesn't melt. People there walk around in thick coats even in June and July. Open drinks inside the houses, books inside the cabinets, and even medicines all serve as evidence that someone lived here before you. Abandoned vehicles left under the snow outside are part of this evidence. In an abandoned city where the silence is so extreme, 
The most chilling sound you hear from time to time is the howling of stray wolves roaming the area. This place has become more of a habitat reclaimed by nature than a human domain. The overgrown wild plants in the surroundings are another indicator of this. Especially after complete darkness falls in Vorkuta, venturing outside is indeed a courageous endeavor. While outside, even the faintest noise can make you break into a cold sweat. This is because you can't see anything beyond 20 meters around you and the entire city is engulfed in darkness. The possibility of a wild animal running towards you from the darkness is not a low probability at all. Perhaps the most beautiful aspect of Vorkuta is that it preserves all its originality from its era without any alterations. The reliefs on Soviet buildings, the vertical neon signs, they all stand as if it were just yesterday. This place could easily be turned into a perfect museum city of the recent century. One of the rare infrastructures that still function in the city apart from people is its traffic lights. Even they are a relic of the Soviet era, as the traffic lights aren't even mounted on a pole. Similarly, the bus stops are far from modern and can be likened to trash containers, so to speak. Actually, the presence of active bus transportation in this abandoned city seems like a privilege in itself. There's no good hospital in the region, nor is there a university. If these people suffer from a sudden illness, it doesn't seem possible for them to find a solution in Vorkuta. Furthermore, although the apartment buildings where people live have functioning heating systems, the pipes from the abandoned units in the building are frozen, so hot water or heat cannot be transmitted to the other occupied units. There are vehicles moving around in the city, but they too are limited to those sent here by trains. In other words, they only work within Vorkuta. Food and medicine supply to the residents in the region are also carried out through these trains. The city's residents are generally people aged 50 and above who are helpless and poor. Young people who come of age don't stay here. They seek a better life by immigrating to Moscow and Europe even if it means leaving their families behind. Because there are only mining jobs here, and the frequent accidents in the mines lead young people to seek opportunities in other cities. Indeed, when you examine the cemetery in the region, the photos of those who have lost their lives belong to very young individuals. These people have lost their lives in the active four mines in the region over the past 20 years. When you review the reports of the deceased from open sources, reasons such as mine explosions, methane gas, falling rocks, and falling from heights are mentioned. Still, if you ever consider settling in Vorkuta in the future, let's also talk about the real estate market there. If you want to buy an apartment in Vorkuta today, you can purchase a three-bedroom apartment for only 150,000 rubles. 150,000 Russian rubles equate to 1,500 American dollars today, so buying a home in Vorkuta might be one of the cheapest ways to own property abroad. This might sound like a funny thought to you. However, there is a very high probability that this place will appreciate over the next 100 years. Because we have a climate problem that the whole world and climate scientists acknowledge, once upon a time, Countries in the mid-latitudes of Europe and the Middle East had summer temperatures in the 30s, but today you can easily see temperatures of 50 degrees Celsius in these regions. Considering the possibility that these temperatures will continue to rise over time, places like Greenland and Vorkuta, which are close to the poles, will warm up and become more livable in terms of climate. This will likely drive up the value of properties in these areas, and the value of apartments in the region will probably reach hundreds of thousands of dollars. Today, those who have homes there have left Vakuta with their belongings because they couldn't find buyers for their homes. But it is by no means a miracle for these homeowners to potentially own one of the most valuable pieces of land in the world in the near future. In summary, Vorkuta is one of the most fascinating cities in the world, both due to its historical past and its climate conditions. 
Anyone wishing to live here must adapt to discomfort and be content with the amenities of 50 years ago. Additionally, even in the months of May and June, they must be prepared to wear coats and hats. For instance, would you be willing to go to this desolate and freezing city in one of the northernmost points of Russia to live there, even if you received a very good salary offer? Or are these icy old cities ultimately doomed to disappear over time? If you enjoyed the video and would like to see more interesting city videos like this, please feel free to like the video and subscribe to the channel.